It was at 8.53 that a vision ended on AM, March 25th, 2018, at the Tully ball field with the sun rising. I was sitting here, and I had just thought about the incident where I was at Pacific High and Cobanchina Ways Day, Samurai Sword, because I was defiant and trying to save the abortion dog. And then I remember I, you know, his sword over my head and all, and then all the people, the Zendos behind him, and then the next instant I was standing there about five or ten feet out of the side of the dome out of the way, so I guess I wasn't pulling me aside, but I was thinking about that, and then the, uh, uh, what happened is that, uh, I got a vision, and in the vision, there was, uh, it looked like a golden row of it's like bodhisattvas or saints or such, and there was also uh, Kobanchino, and he was uh, sitting on a kind of a, a flat chair, or and it was curved up, but in it, and he was he had his sword in his hand. And then, but on the side, there were um, rows on either side. There was a, a row of, looked like uh, bodhisattva saints, all golden. Everything was golden except for him and the chair and the sword. But what happened be, is that... Uh, um, just before he appeared, though, the, um, all of, uh, and before his chair and the sword, it was that, uh, there was a Asian, uh, goddess that appeared, and she appeared in the middle between these rows of, uh, golden saints, and, uh, bodhisattvas and such, and she had this message, and the message was about the uh, incident that was bothering him as well, about being, uh, uh, having to use his sword to confront someone who was defiant, a matter of uh, lack of self-restraint. So, in that manner, it was a manner of... Uh, my forgiving him, and then the thing was is that I said, well, I didn't know because it it seemed like uh, I hadn't thought about forgiving him, but I, I just didn't see uh, the point at first, and then, uh, you know, it was like that was something that was bothering him and going much farther in space and time and whatever, and so, you know, I said I would consider it, of course, or not of course, but I said I, you know, I think about it, or I was being involved in it, essentially, and um, uh, when he appeared, I, you know, that mental conversation occurred sort of spontaneously, instantly, and was over almost instantly as well and the communication was there that uh, I was in uh, a sort of um, examination of an adventure or something and uh, from my point of view and my point of view was visionary and the visionary point of view was the point of view of someone who was in facing off against um, Coben, and then the idea that um, I Coben could show me something, and then 
I said that would be fine or something to that effect. And then uh, we were traveling uh, side by side, and then I said somehow uh, uh, we agreed to travel together in the same vehicle or something, and it could have been the over the chair, or, but the idea that uh, we were traveling and then um, we were going somewhere and it was somewhere that was a uh, divine realm and uh, the stars, of course, were passing by uh, around us and we were going into another realm and that realm was a spiritual realm and it was a realm of uh, like a Bodhi consciousness, a Buddha consciousness and a consciousness that was very expansive and beyond the full comprehension, yet it was within his full available reach, and that's where he had been, and that's uh, where he had been calm from. Because of the particular alignment of thought that occurred when I thought about the incident, and that incident brings to mind a c lack of control and a lack of ability to see through um, the way to achieve the goal without having to resort to violence, which is what he had to do. And so the lesson for me and the lesson for him is that the uh, nonviolent approach, which I had been brought up with, um, somehow was at uh, odds with the uh, violent approach that he had been brought up with. And that means that the entire structure of Zen has an underlying approach and acceptance of violence as a possibly as a means of survival and a means of achieving goals and all that kind of stuff, whereas the means of achieving those things uh, through nonviolence is another methodology yet uh, faced with this sort of it is ineffective. And then the consequence of the uh, travel was in that uh, the consciousness that he had and I had uh, became separated when we arrived at a place that had a sort of an expansive view of the universe. And in that view, you could see the Buddha and the far distance and all these others that uh, had achieved that realm. And that realm was something that he could travel easily in and without and have the shared consciousness of all the uh, achieved and enlightened uh, Buddhas and those who had gone through and other types of experiences in other types of bodies over the universe and the all expansive consciousness, which he had become part of, and the ability to transfer the mind through space and time and the ability to contact consciousness within the scope of many types of uh, uh, events and minds and become part of adventures and other types of things that only the enlightened consciousness can uh, be able to share. And that achievement of that sharing of that consciousness is something which is within his grasp and within the grasp of those who can contact that and be able to share and be able to understand uh, exactly their place in it, which is a part in the fabric of space and time. And the consciousness which Coben has and is achieved is not quite uh, Buddha consciousness, which would uh, be very close to the Buddha, much closer, yet he is a point that is a, like an easy traveler, because I could see from my viewpoint when I was there that he was in a separate uh, vehicle than mine, and we were able to see where those who had achieved those types of uh, enlightened consciousness which is described closer as white or as it got closer to the full Buddha consciousness and the, uh, the Buddha face and all in the body. And then as we uh, achieved that, we uh, turned and returned together in the same vehicle uh, somehow merged and then achieved the uh, uh, re-entry into this uh, Consciousness informed the exact time, uh, 8.53 a.m., the uh, contact consciousness with Kobenchino unresolved, understood then the ability to go through all these sequences uh, again uh, appropriately and through uh, space-time coordination 
with other consciousness available to Coben and other consciousness who have achieved and maintained conscious connection with those and have achieved over the web of space and time in the network of social convention and conversation are able to come to the conclusions that they are not unresolved in their un independence, yet they have uh, a contact that can erase them out of the um, unconnectedness, and that is by being connected with those leaders or those who are in contact uh, with that, which is that which is considered the Buddha consciousness and that Kobear and others are trying others to attain. And I assume that is his uh, main message to the leaders in his uh, group. I see uh, they probably uh, progressed quite much since they uh, took over the Kenando and other places. So good luck to them. Oh, what is... Uh... <clears throat> Nine oh five AM, let's go out harder. It's uh, March twenty fifth, uh, Sunday San Jose, California, twenty twenty five. Just as I uh, lay down and close my eyes, uh Coben appeared in, in my mind's eye or in my dream. <laughs> I wasn't even asleep yet. Uh, so anyway, um, almost, uh, uh, well, he asked me, would you like to learn archery? And I said yes. And all of a sudden, we were transported into this rural environment in a field, uh, a dense uh, grassy field with, you know, wild and off in the distance, you know, uh, a few hundred yards away was a forested area and then, so there was no target or anything. It was just um, out in the wild and then uh, he showed me how to hold the bow uh, and how to string it and then uh, how to pull it. And then, you know, the idea I asked, you know, is, uh, and then for shooting it, though, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't like the other it wasn't like how I learned archery in college. I took a class where you had a target and you tried to hit a target. And so he said the target like wasn't where you thought it would be or something of that nature. And then he would show me <coughs> and, and shoot without really looking at what he was shooting at and hit what he was going to hit and such as... Uh, part of a branch and I tried it and then uh, he said well but for the prey or the enemy in a distance you cannot always see you cannot see them and there's the underbrush and they're hiding and they're moving and they're running and they're uh, it's not possible to use uh, a method of aiming to hit your target. So uh, then he showed me how he could hit it, and uh, it was uh, uh, looked like a small deer running, and it was running, and it was it had, it was running across the field, and it was. It had noticed, it had heard the noise I made when I had shot my arrow, and then it was running, and so, and then it, it was hidden at points uh, between uh, bigger bushes, but kept running towards the uh, distance, and then 
he just smiled and pulled back his bow and smiling at me he just uh, uh, was able to aim it in such a way in such a distance such an angle and then let go and it flew into the air and then right before the animal got to the woods it was struck and fell dead so he was able to shoot in an arc over a, a great distance without really looking at his target but knowing exactly where it was and where it's going to be at a certain point in time as he stretched his bow and he explained this is uh, shooting from the heart because you don't actually see or know or it's some kind of internal calculation of space and time that goes beyond the regular means of our targeting and because of this um, it's sort of an intuitive thing but it's based on many factors such as in a spatial intelligence that goes beyond normal ability and is sort of a family leaning edge ability that is able to transcend the particular confinements of here and now and see there and then and through that being able to judge the particular angles and rates of descent according to an intuitive mode and then also being able to intuitively feel exactly what the target is, where it is going, how it is moving, what its intentions are, and what its actual fate or decision-making process is going to lead it to a particular place. And this is a form of intuition, is a forward-looking intuition or space-time intuition that allows the practitioner to see the future in a particular manner that allows them to do their work in a particular way and achieve their goals upon this particular projected path and the attainment is not necessarily always the um, you know killing of a uh, an animal for food or the enemy uh, in battle, but is uh, necessarily a, a form of uh, consciousness, and that consciousness reaches beyond the extent of normal every day, and it is part of some particular culture's uh, intuitive background that is passed on through lineage, through family relations and training, and that particular training is well suited for a mentality such as Coben's because of the ability it endows to not only see and move through space and time with action and intent, but to do these things in other realms and other types of actions and intents, and that is the intent of action and Zen. This recording is about the uh, uh, kind of mental exchange with Coben I've had about the calligraphic aspects of Buddhist literature and the in implications of calligraphic errors such as uh, wrong curves and such a uh, uh, angular motion of the pen and brush or brush. And then the other applications in other scripts, uh, not just the Chinese, it, um, I mean the Japanese, Chinese, and other various scripts, and the Sanskrit. So the entire uh, revelation to me basically was his uh, showing me of various. Uh, Buddhist text that uh, illustrated the point and that point was that there were errors that were almost imperceptible and these errors were uh, calligraphic or 
we might see them as a misshapen letter or a form and therefore the reading or sounding of that is incorrect and the uh, meaning is incorrect even though it may be similar or even almost the same but the actual meaning could have been lost so then there are instances on pages shown where one particular error leads to many errors and there are errors uh, not just of uh, omission or such but actual um, uh, even commentaries that are placed in the that are later made that are basically incorrect and misleading and these are basically corrupting the entire uh, Buddhist script or literature the literature that we know and describe from the Western point of view is uh, say the sutras or in the Indian tradition Upanishads and other types of uh, scripts scriptures and then there are various translations into the other forms across Asia so the translations and the scriptural uh, changes meaning the uh, changes in the way the letters are formed the uh, script uh, changes in time and the translation from one language to another the uh, inconsistency in the ability to transfer meaning with the signs especially the Chinese signs which are really so general that you need specific instruction and understanding the application especially on a tonal manner but it's probably better understood in a tonal manner if you could understand the vocabulary and related uh, concepts as they're laid out but then looking to us uh, say Sanskrit and the other forms are the early forms of the meanings of the words um, provides some context so across this wide spectrum of documents which are considered to be Buddhist literature that extend uh, from Japan across Asia and into uh, India of course so all these are part of a huge corpus of work that is uh, comparable to the Western work except there's much more importance that has to be placed on the actual writing of it uh, after a certain time and the implications as they go for different sects or different parts of the religious uh, belief and the deviations from these um, beliefs uh, basically are misinterpretations possibly or other interpretations of script that are perfectly logical but unintended so the problem is such uh, that it is uh, within the entire Buddhist corpus of writing and can only be approached as a total those approaching this corpus of writing and understanding from a Western point of view are going to be sorely disappointed because they have a limited consciousness and awareness of what is actually possible or what has actually been said because of the limitations of English and even the limitations of uh, most of these scripts 
that convey this. So a person's understanding of the Dharma or of, uh, they would say, the Eightfold Path or all these concepts have to be trained through the wisdom, which is the threads that make the manuscripts, and they all have to be aligned perfectly, and then through this alignment they can be squeezed, and say squeezing the sutras means compressing them, and compressing them means that the strands of the lines, the text, and such, all become superimposed, and then the ability to find correspondences across the vocabularies used in the expression of the description of the Buddhist philosophy, religion, and other aspects of its science of mind, especially is applicable to the Zen practice meditation, especially to the Soda branch. And then the idea that the thoughts, when translated, are so foreign from what their meaning is that we have to find a common ground in understanding and linguists find it through words and expression, verbal sounds, sentences that express meaning that are understood by the speaker and understood in the mind. This is an essential part of Zen, is the knowing through the hearing and the seeing of the letters is secondary because of the misleading nature of calligraphic expression. And therefore, seeing this or seeing a specific concept as portrayed in a particular calligraphic expression such as uh, some lines in the Japanese calligraphy or in the Chinese script or other uh, related scripts, they have particular meanings that are not translatable to Western languages. And the main difficulty that is with that concept um, is that the bridges haven't been built, and the bridges are word bridges. They're word bridges that are built with symbols, and the symbols are letters and signs, and the signs are also expressive of concepts which they hold particular affinity to through tradition. Now, understanding the goal of Coban scrutiny of the text, the religious text, sutras and others, is to find the, ex the exact meaning that would show a simplified path. And that simplified path is within the scripture, so it's not something that is alien, and it is something that is so simple that it evades comprehension by the scholars. And that simplicity is a simplicity of mind that is related to the direct expression. That direct expression is something that transcends words or the words that even that we can share. Therefore, to pretend you know what a Buddhist scripture is by reading its translation in English is absurd. And Coben's main argument with English is that its inability to express concepts that are without or outside its own scope of expression. 
therefore, Coben's own approach to these problems is a simplification through a sort of chopping it up. And that means that the ways of looking at scripture has been uh, simplified to the point where it's uh, practically adapted to the Western mentality and such things as, well, indexes and footnotes and all those things are so immaterial to the understanding of the sutra, the scripture, the knowledge contained within it. And therefore, getting through the scripture through the words is the most difficult part for the Westerner. And the Westerner who does not understand the language or the shapes of the symbols that make up the words of the written script in Japanese or Chinese, Vietnamese, all of these have various formats and forms that express a type of consciousness that is present throughout Asia and within the grammatical structure and linguistic styles that express this basic understanding of reality that regular English or other Romance language or have a difficulty with in that they are not particularly meant to express these kinds of things. And we could even say that the Asian scripts aren't necessarily meant or based on a format that allows easy conscious uh, understanding of the scripture except for the Sanskrit and closely related scripts that are definitive in defining the scientific concepts that are contained in the corpus or the logic of the Buddhist or the enlightened scriptures. And looking through that prism or that telescope or that magnifying glass into the scriptures, we say they are, are squeezed down. And that means that when you look through one scripture that is translated to another scripture, does it squeeze down every thought? And they say in uh, Western literature in relation to Bible studies and other types of uh, study of the scripts and related uh, scriptures in the Western world, such as the Bible, there is many types of concordances and other such types of things that present this type of knowledge in a format that is uh, not only the same or similar to the Buddhist format, but we could say that it is more confusing in that it doesn't have much relation at all to the pure concepts that are being related by the Buddhist philosophy and the letters and calligraphy that are used to transmit it. In this respect, having a view of the total relationship of all these texts to one another is helpful, but in the format of a book, it becomes impossible to visualize. If you were to have pages of erudite footnotes floating around and various types of links to other concepts and papers and such that is the uh, common practice in Western scholarship when applied to 
the Eastern scriptures, they can make mincemeat out of the minds of any aspiring student interested in enlightenment. And therefore, seeing the structure of the linguistic to the actual letters and written form is important, but the actual squeezing allows the unsqueezing or the decompressing of this information. This information is an easily condensed if it has attachments through footnotes, indexes, tables, and such that are otherwise unavailable to the conscious and viewing mind. So the actual representation of an idea on paper is sometimes confusing, and it's only saving graces that it is recorded and someone can try to remember what the true concept is. And this is an entirely scientific process that is necessitates a computer study and the classification of all of this knowledge into a format that is easily trans um, accessible over various formats across various language and disciplines so that the ability to find the hidden metadata within any stroke or any letter that you draw is extremely important. This means that the placement of these letters becomes more important than sometimes what you say or how you read them and the actual direction is important but may change if the mind changes to change them and the way that you read is normal in a particular direction but then insight comes out of experimentation so one cannot be forced into conclusions that aren't necessarily based on these kinds of logic. Therefore, having just little bits of information that are able to be constructed into this structure by placing them in their compartments means that they can be compared to other uh, comparable layered indexed uh, attributed uh, placements of the actual graphic and its linguistic uh, connection is also noted but the mental explanation that is given as possibly a commentary or explanation has to transcend the pure brevity that the actual calligraphic work would uh, provide. Therefore, looking into the structure of the form means that what you see in the Japanese or Chinese or Sanskrit is something that is the real and that is what allows the mind to uh, attain the understanding of the concept instead of the translation. Therefore, if you cannot read it in its original, you can at least look at it in its original and that in itself is part of the learning because the truth in the form is the truth that it also in endows to the reader or the viewer and those that think that reading are reading aloud and reading words and knowing words is the some 
that to uh, part of this process would find that they are wasting more time than they are saving when they use their minds, which is a difficult mm, task because the mind in itself isn't necessarily a good instrument to decipher these things that are beyond the mental comprehension. Therefore, putting the body's attributes or assets to use in the application of understanding of Scripture is a highly important aspect. And looking at the actual page of Scripture in its original format also endows the viewer with an understanding of the tradition. And from that, they have a lineal knowledge that leaves them with understanding that transcends the mere translation that could be given in another language that is not suited for conveying religious or Buddhist concepts and the scientific concepts of Zen and meditation and all the other types of descriptive commentary about the world and universe and people and their lives. And therefore, seeing these things in the hands of a single person, a single calligrapher who writes and sees and draws what they are to hear and to feel and to be in their Zen mind is the purpose of doing the drawing and having the ability to touch the pen to the paper and feel the actual force of the flow, of the meaning. The meaning is through the motion, and the motion endows the wisdom. The wisdom comes from the understanding that there is there is the motion, and through that, the knowledge becomes simple. The knowledge is simply truncated by its context and reality. Therefore, it leaves the practitioner with an understanding that is more basic than the understanding that words allow or translations allow. And that understanding is a physical understanding of the meaning of the letter and of the word and of the script and of the scripture. And the intellectual understanding of these things is an entirely different aspect that is not covered in this. But the actual part that is described here is a preparation for that type of thinking because it is it, it asserts that the higher thinking that relates with all these terms and terminologies, concepts as they flow in or interrelated, can only be based upon an experiential type of understanding of what these things are. And just hearing them or living the world or living in the world and not having the scripture in your heart is difficult. Therefore, the scripture becomes part of the motion, the motion becomes part of the life, and therefore as you move, you move in the motion of the calligraphic type of style, therefore your motions are in tune with the motion of the universe, and therefore you are the writing in the motion in time, and that calligraphic motion is something that we as humans can do with the knowledge of these types of concepts. Therefore, in writing one's own life, it's like a walking exercise, but the part that is more difficult is to be able to do these things that allow you to walk through the lines, the threads of the scripture, and this is through a process of finding the path in the letters and the path in the letters is such that it leads you through the line and over the paper. The, the scripture is correct, meaning that if it has been written correctly, 
it will have a particular structure that is identifiable by its meter in particular and its uh, substance. And there is a way that the ordinary mind can tell whether a scripture is correct or incorrect. And that is through a logical processing against the linguistic apparatus that they're born with or with the language that they hold inherent and therefore using that inherent computerized view of that they can come to a realization whether that scripture is correct in an application to a uh, entire script or set of sutras or entire set of documents within a corpus such as Buddhism the actual relation of all of these instances is so um, multitudinous that it requires more than a mind can uh, or a normal human mind can uh, accomplish. Therefore, in a, a project that would involve the scholarship of those who were interested in finding the underlying errors in the calligraphic structure would have to go through the entire a corpus of works throughout all of Asia and those that are using these, including all the other works that are not necessarily termed Buddhist, but within the corpus that comes to contribute to the main understanding that possibly became uh, parts of the Buddhist uh, structure of thinking and religion in later times. Therefore, the tradition and the lineages that pass on this knowledge pass on more than just knowledge of letters and of drawing and of writing, but of the tradition of knowing. And that tradition of knowing goes beyond words, but it is best expressed in words or actions. And those actions, again, are the calligraphy of a person's life as they extend from birth to death. And this is the work of the person as they write their book of life. And this is in each day they write that. And therefore, they have the contact with it, which we might say is the path or the dharma or the way. And if that path is mis disrupted by bad thinking or wasted time, trying to comprehend that which is not correct and those things which aren't organized properly, then there was time which we have here is wasted in some some layer, and in summary, I see that the in uh, uh, the future of this study is, uh, Coben has uh, presented it is such that it requires an entire an enormous amount of organization of scriptures and such. And the um, actual alignment of the graphics uh, to be able to uh, see where these all come from. This is not a wordy kind of thing. It is wordy, but it isn't from the pros from the viewpoint of we see in Western literature that is so caught up with with papers and this and. And all this knowledge tied up in in this paper and that paper, no relation, and the minds that want to find wisdom in that system are just sorely hampered by the lack of connectivity, the lack of cohesion, the lack of similar purpose, and the lack of ability of the people that are making the commentary because of the lack of unified uh, understanding of what the problems are, what the concepts that they need to be approaching are. And this becomes easier in Buddhism because of the particular uh, construct of the Buddhist thought is encompassing and is not so much restricted uh, to individual minds in the there are so many with so many thoughts that think the same way about the same thing, yet offer opportunities of particular unique uh, approaches to understanding. 
Yet all these things are so involved and intellectual that it are much farther beyond the normal scope of the into intellectual tools of the man and woman who want to make progress in this life without a lot of struggle. And therefore, just giving them a booklet, oh, just do this and believe that, is going to not only confuse them, it's going to cause more damage than good. Therefore, in a way that we would see as uh, progressive, the uh, tools that are given are not so much tools of uh, belief, but tools that they would have the faith to be able to find uh, what they're looking for through their own effort and not through something handed to them in a translated booklet or a, a little uh, compilation of tidbits that make you feel good. The further uh, focus of this is not only the in bringing easier enlightenment, but to bypass the entire structure or the entire process of trying to do something of such an immense nature with such trepidation and just do it. And the uh, manner and methodology is uh, explained as an instantaneous type of sudden enlightenment, which isn't bounded by the the cords of discipline, yet because of that, it is unbounded and unrestrained and in, 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 in effect occasionally or often ineffectual. So this type of enlightening awareness isn't gradual and it doesn't allow for a type of buildup of consciousness that are can transcend the dumb or the stupidness of everyday people in everyday life that occurs through random circumstance. This may not be your plight or the plight of most intellectual or, or well, you know, educated people, but for those uneducated and unwilling to attach themselves to some doctrine of discipline it becomes necessary to impose various thoughts that they can easily adapt. And these are the norms of society that we hold as particular truths and adopt throughout all cultures. At 8.37 a.m. on April 7th, in San Jose, uh, I was thinking about what I had seen when Coben was showing me the Buddhist literature, and it appeared as uh, blocks of text and books and lines and all like the uh, geometrical matrix that. Uh, you could see it orderly, and but there were uh, parts hidden behind, but I guess that's the past. Um, in that, I wondered, oh, I guess that is the library of the knowledge, of, you know, the corpus of Buddhist literature as condensed into the written forms that they use. So that was uh, aligned to sort of a idea uh, visually, and it was uh, used by Coben to explain the uh, corpus of Buddhist thought in that regard. And then I wondered where that library was, and then I guess, well, I guess uh, uh, Coben took it with him to the uh, his hidden uh, palace. And then I wondered, I guess he just brought it out to show me, or he just showed me a copy. And then at that point, uh, uh, Coben appeared and said he was going to install the library in me. 
And I said, thank you, and bowed three times. And he installed it. And then behi I, behind him were other teachers just kept appearing in a long line. And that was it. I mean, it was pretty light in here, so I couldn't see too far back. I mean, in time, which I believe that was. Anyway, so that's the end of this conversation. And it's now 8.40. Anyway.